to one agent, but is still sensitive to another. And understanding that biological process using computational techniques, I think, is one of the key challenges of, of turning cancer from it to a largely universally fatal disease, what, 50 years ago, to now a chronic disease where a person with cancer can expect to be treated for five years, 10 years, 20 years in some cases, but with changing medication over time because of that uh, phenomenon of uh, mutation in the tumour is uh, a really hard medical challenge and I think a very hard computer, computational challenge. This slide describes where I think SNOMED CT can be used. I, I do think at the moment probably it's key use uh, for persuading clinicians about value is in that box around clinical information changing. And again, I'll show you later some slides, uh, some screenshots of the kind of tools that I use in my own day-to-day -day life. And I think that you're trying to, or maybe already have built uh, in Switzerland. I think because of the structure of your country, you've created yourself an incredibly hard challenge, which is to say you have cantonal structures with their own laws, their own systems, and trying to exchange that data in a small country on the basis of 22 states using different languages is a phenomenal administrative and man management challenge. And I wish you luck. <laughs> <laughs> I just think, because uh, I think it, in my, the ability to have a, for, for a GP to create a problem list and exchange that with the local hospital. The local hospital probably doesn't have a radiotherapy department, so that patient has to then go, I don't know, to Zurich Hospital or Bern Hospital, have their radiotherapy, go back down the chain. If that data is going to be in exchanged in a computationally active way that benefits them as opposed to a series of PDFs, then you've got to have some form of terminology to make that happen. And as I say, if your laws are different, so actually doing that across boundaries, across cantonal boundaries, if your languages are different, then you've got a phenomenal challenge. I don't think it's an unbeatable one. And Vera and I managed to make the computer work, so we're well on the way, aren't we, Vera? <laughs> it was not easy. <laughs> um, I'm sure you're aware that uh, Snowman CT does interact with a very large number of organizations across those headings. Um, in my uh, little bit of the world, um, uh, for example, my, my set of hospitals, we use what is now called Oracle, uh, used to be called Sona. So we, um, we have a staff base of about 25,000 people, of which about 10,000 are clinicians. And we would expect all of those clinicians to understand something about the problem list and to create um, assets within the electronic health record delivered by Oracle Health. And that in itself is a challenge because like all commercial relationships, there's tension there. They work too slowly from our, from our perspective. We're, um, irascible clinicians from their perspective. We don't pay them enough. We pay them too much. You know, all of those things make th this attention. And that will be true, I think, across all of those vendors. And we have the same kind of tensions, I would say, with standard development organizations. So um, the relationship with HL7 is actually very potent and very powerful at the moment, mainly because of the development of fire and that SNOMED is a very important part of fire as it's developing. Our relationship with WHO, on the other hand, is less healthy. Um, there's tension there. They want, they have a classification. Many, I think, of the staff who are writing 
uh, assets in the classification are still, I think, in a sort of world where the classification is the only thing to code. Whereas I'd say as a clinician, the only thing to code is in what's in my head. And that is different to what a classification has to do. But that sort of continuous spectrum of ideas about what a doctor and nurse's work is compared to what a country needs to know about its health is a really important part of the discussion and the debate. And I won't go through all of those, but it's really just to emphasize how wide the connectivity of SNOMED to international um, uh, standards organizations and others is, um, and what an important part of the day-to-day sort of -day world. I've talked a lot, I think, about um, how, where, you know, both how and where SNOMED CT is used. Um, one of the things I'm particularly interested in for hospital care is what we call point of care analytics. And it's that ability using the health record and the structured data within the health record, well, perhaps, and here I think is some terminological challenge. Me, and I think all of my clinical colleagues, think that the electronic health record is the thing that's on the screen. In other words, we visualize it as a record. You may, as informaticians, visualize it as a database somewhere in the back. And getting that comprehension, I think, is quite a challenge. Because I just think the data is there. You just have to scrape it off the screen. And that, of course, isn't how it works. And so one of the ways into that is this question of how you get point of care analytics. How do you create a letter or a note or a document or a message that's useful to a clinician uh, in the hospital, but also generates a summarized set of data that is useful to the general practitioner and where the content of the of my thinking as a hospital doctor is not lost on the GP and vice versa. And um, the GP has usually an amazingly long association with each individual patient. Certainly with some older GPs, that can be a lifelong association. They know that individual from being a child, teenager, adult, old person, and they may have a 30 or even 40 year association. Summarizing that information usefully for the receiving doctor in the hospital is a massive competition challenge, I think. It's a massive human challenge. What do I, you know, if I'm a GP, what do I tell the hospital doctor about the fact that this patient has attended 20 times in the last 10 years? with a nose cold. Does he need to know that? I don't know. Um, probably not. But of course, if you're worried about either the psychological aspects of that patient and thinking, why do they use health services so much? Or does this person have a, an immunological deficiency that I need to be thinking about? Those questions are very different, but they may both be reflected by that attendance record uh, in the GP practice. And finding ways of thinking about that for health purposes is where you get efficiencies from, it's where you get better treatment, it's where you get more precise care for the individual, either with a psychological disturbance or with an immunological disease, both of which, of course, need treatment, probably. Um, but those, I think, are some of the uh, opportunities for the use of, uh, of a structured terminology really eff efficiently. Um, Vera, I'm sure, will we'll share these slides with you so that if you want to follow any of the detail on this slide. But essentially here, we're just describing some 
uh, of the use of uh, SNOMED CT across the world. Um, you can see that my organizing parts NHS Trust is there about the way we use SNOMED CT uh, for regional analytics, and I'll go into that in my second presentation. Um, Cambridge University Hospitals, uh, who are an EPIC user, uh, are making EPIC use of SNOMED, actually. Um, so there are lots and lots of examples where, you know, if you wanted somebody to come and uh, see what's happening, uh, how to use uh, systems in different ways. Uh, there's lots of opportunities when people are traveling around the world to sort of drop in somewhere and say, how did you do that? How did you do this? And those sort of questions, which uh, might be supported, I guess, by you as a uh, leadership organization in Switzerland. Um, again, we have lots of documented uh, areas of benefit and for service, individual patient health and so on, which are on the confluence side. So my guess is Perro's probably got a confluence account. I don't know if Julia has a confluence account, but uh, you know, you there are lots and lots of assets on uh, our website, uh, which will give you a, a route into uh, these things. Where might we make difference, which doesn't necessarily involve uh, the immediate and dedicated use of Snowball CT in clinical practice by every doctor. And I think some of that comes from the kind of assets that people are creating everywhere. Um, so I'd be surprised if you hadn't heard of UK Biobank. So UK Biobank is an extraordinary idea, I think, created about 20 years ago where some academics in Oxford said, one of the issues is getting to sufficient data to make um, investigations and studies at scale using data assets and to link that to um, freely donated uh, human resources from patients. That might be blood, it might be tissue biopsies, it might be CT scans, it might be MRI scans, it might be ultrasound scans and so on. So UK Biobank gives you access on a by permission basis, but a very um, reasonable cost to an extraordinary array of assets, some of which increasingly now are annotated with SNOMED so that you can begin to investigate a set of biological assets. You may say you're a pharmaceutical and you want to test some ideas. You can begin to ask those questions using a real-time biological bank. And my guess is, again, that there are biobanks being created already in place in Switzerland all over the place. But the question and the challenge will be, how is that annotated? How are they structured? How do you get to the data and get something useful out? of it? The reason that matters is because of the switch, I think, towards precision medicine, towards wanting to understand the precise genome of a patient. And that genomic data is now available in many biobanks with the precise phenotype of that patient. Okay, so they had this set of mutations in their genome. How did that affect their health from a phenotypic point of view? Did they have high blood pressure? Did they have low blood pressure? Was their pulse different? And so on and so forth. Uh, you know, and the number of analytes in biochemistry and blood and hematology and so on are enormous. So putting all of those data together give us a new way of thinking about health, which is pretty uh, extraordinary, I think. I mean, one of my reflections over my lifetime in clinical practice is that when I qualified, and I hardly dare tell you when I qualified, because at least that young man wasn't born then. Um, so I qualified in 1976. <laughs> and at that time, in my specialty, men with haemophilia died in their 20s or 30s 
from the ravages of intramuscular and intra-articular bleeding. And during my lifetime, I as a hematologist probably made that worse by um, managing to treat the bleeding, but at the same time by infecting those individuals with either hepatitis B, hepatitis C, or HIV. And the generation of men with haemophilia that I knew as a young doctor are mostly dead from either hepatitis and its consequences or HIV. There's obviously new generations of haemophiliacs who are protected from being infected with, the, with those viruses, so that no longer happens because we've bioengineered factor eight and factor nine. And even more amazingly, in my lifetime, there are now genetic treatments for both factor eight deficiency and factor nine deficiency that look as though in the majority of people with those inherited disorders are cured. That's in 40, 50 years. And that will happen in almost everything that we can think of. But to get there requires astonishing amounts of data to make those sort of differences. Um, so just a few slides about, because uh, Barrow wanted me just to sort of alert you to what's available out there. Um, so I've talked about uh, Confluence and sort of linked to Confluence, we have a learning platform uh, with that title there. Um, you have to make a Confluence account and you have to make a learning platform account. But once you're in, there are some, I think, quite nice learning things for clinical staff. There are certainly some, because <laughs> I did them some years ago, some quite challenging learning uh, about descriptive logic and use of SNOMED CT. At least I think for those who have qualified in medicine, I found, I found some of the learning things on how to use, on not how to use, on the structure of SNOMED quite uh, challenging, but I would guess you as a, as a group think, well, that's so easy. Um, but so there's some really nice things I think to do. Um, at the moment, they're all free. We used to charge for some of them, but I think at the moment they're all free. And I would really encourage you as a group to join some of our learning programs, because I think you can suddenly move your knowledge of SNOMED CT from just the kind of ideas I've been sharing with you to very deep practical knowledge on how to, uh, how best to implement SNOMED CT, how it works from a computational point of view, why clinicians might start to get interested and, uh, and so on. It's a sort of weird reflection, isn't it, on the world that SNOMED as a pathology uh, terminology was developed in the 1970s. And we're now in 1920, uh, 2023, and we're still talking about what do we need to do to make people use this? And I do think that's that's a challenge. It's a challenge for me as you know for working for Snowman International. It's a challenge for you as leaders in your health system about that move that you have in your strategy of digitizing health. If you don't do this, you won't digitize health. And if you so you've got to find ways of it being normal in a university undergraduate course for doctors for them to learn something about clinical informatics. And I don't know whether you do or don't in Switzerland. There is only one hospital in England, one, one university hospital that teaches clinical informatics as part of the medical curriculum. Most of our young doctors qualify not having used an electronic health record. I feel both fretful about that and slightly ashamed that I've not managed to make that change. I've had lots of arguments and lots of discussion with my colleagues, but they inevitably say the curriculum is full. There's too much to learn. The doctor's brains are stuffed. They can't take any more, and we're certainly not going to try and teach them how to use computational tools. 
And I, so I don't know what to do about that because, you know, I'm up against the deans of the medical schools and they don't want to make that change. And I put, I put it to them, they have to make that change if they want to do the things they all talk about in research terms and in changing health systems and so on. But man, is it hard work. I slightly exaggerate how hard it is, of course, but we're nowhere near where I think we should be uh, against the whole platform of clinical informatics. Um, I, I'm slightly embarrassed here because I can't remember if, I, if we have any Swiss doctors in our clinical reference groups. Um, we certainly have a fair number of Americans fair number of UK docs, there's some Belgians, quite a lot of people from uh, the Nordic states, Denmark, Sweden, uh, Norway and so on. I can't remember if there are any Swiss. Uh, the Germans are beginning to get interested. Uh, as you know, they joined the SNOMED community a couple of years ago. And uh, the Dutch are, uh, are, are deeply involved in this, but there are uh, clinical reference groups for many areas. And if you have links to people who go, I'd really like to know more. I'd like to be a participant. I'd like to influence the way SNOMED works and so on. There are all sorts of opportunities in joining uh, the CRGs. And they, they mostly come together in our annual meetings and so on. So there are opportunities for people to get rich and famous by joining the CRGs. Well, maybe famous, but not very rich, I suspect. Um, so the CRGs essentially allow, they basically create a platform for people to talk about things, to swap ideas, to create uh, knowledge. Um, they're open to anybody and they're open, we're open to a discussion where somebody says, we really need a CRG in, you know, how to squash tomatoes or whatever the new subject is. Um, so at the moment, the CRGs is a list this long, but it can be this wide or this tall and so on. And we're happy to have that discussion with people who want to create uh, new groups. And sometimes we try and focus people where there's a specific thing to do to uh, create a sort of maybe an editorial group that looks at a really narrow part of, of um, Snowman CT to get it right, to get the quality at a level at which clinicians feel happy to use it and it's computationally correct. Because sometimes, uh, as you've probably uncovered yourselves, Snowman CT is just it's incorrect in places. So the links don't work, the classification, if you put it through an automatic classifier, uh, it just doesn't always make sense. Or there are gaps. And it's about that gap filling that there are opportunities for people uh, to play in. Um, there's some advice on how to... We have a question. Yeah. Sorry, do you mind if I ask it now or at the end? Yeah, uh, fine, no, okay. yeah. And uh, then we have a question. In the chat, do you have an ex any example of implementing SNOMED CT in primary care EHRs? In particular, do you know vendors interested in implementing SNOMED CT in the, their EHR and who purpose SNOMED CT coding in primary to primary care physicians? So great question. And I think I'm going to hold it till because I've only got one more slide. So I'll great. come back and answer that uh, because it, I, I, I think uh, there's lots and lots and lots in that question. So there's some instructions about how to join current uh, CRGs. But if you want to create new ones, come to me, come to Ian, Ian Green, Pero can connect you. Uh, we're, we're up for that. And then just one last plug is um, we have two meetings a year, uh, both the, one of which is a sort of uh, a standard, I would say, medical informatics conference. That's about to happen in a month's time in Atlanta. Uh, and then, but before that, there's a business meeting where some of this participation you can do by joining business meetings. I know Pero joined us in Lisbon uh, a year ago, and I hope it's fair to say that you had a great time, Pero.
First of all, Lisbon is a fantastic place. And secondly, it's just a fantastic conference. So there's a tremendous way of connecting up to people. And basically, the conferences run like this. So in the spring, we have a business meeting only. That's always held in London. And then uh, each year, uh, we have a meeting either in Europe or somewhere in the global community in the other year. So this year, it's in the United States. Next year, actually, it'll be in South Korea. So I think, again, great opportunities for people to sort of have you know, let their hair down, do a bit of that kind of medical conferencing stuff, but also contribute to this community. And the route to do that is by signing up and getting Julia to pay for you to go to the SNOMED CTX, where uh, I'm sure Julia will do that. As she told me before the meeting. <laughs> right, so that's the end of this set of slides. So um, the question I think was, I'll change the slide you can Am I aware of any um, uh, implementations of SNOMED CT in primary care? And I think there are lots and lots of examples of that. And I'm going to start in the UK because that's what I know mostly about. Um, so, as you may or may not know, um, SNOMED CT in its current form came from the American College of Pathologists that had basically uh, an anatomical description of human health with pathological content. And in the 1990s, a GP in the UK called Reed um, developed a set of codes um, for GP practice. And SNOMED CT is basically, uh, and it's, sorry, Reed called his um, um, uh, GP dictionary the Reed clinical terms. And so SNOMED CT came about by merging the American SNOMED pathology with Dr. Reed's clinical terms. Hence, it's called SNOMED clinical terms, and became a very rich um, terminology right across the spectrum of diagnosis through to the detail of pathology and so on. It um, became a standard in the UK for use by general practice back in. 20, 2002, and was a core standard in what we call the National Program for IT. So some of you may be aware that in Tony Blair's time, there was a really great idea that the UK should do what eHealth Swiss have in their digital strategy, which is that health needed to be digitalized. And that program started in 2005. There was a 10 year funding program. And the idea was that the whole of primary care should be digital. And it already was to a large extent. And I might go back to that question uh, uh, to the person who asked the question. Um, and the other idea, not surprisingly, was that all hospital organisations should have an electronic health record. And for all the reasons that you can think of, the National Programme for IT was only about 50% successful, I would say. And the reasons were Politicians lost interest and indeed began to think that it was a waste of money because it was taking longer than people had said it would. So Blair's challenge at the time to the uh, administrators of health was, how long will it take to digitize health? And people went, oh, 
Oh, I don't know. It'll take a long time. And so at least the story is that he looked them in the eye and said, I want it done in three years, in 2005. Well, because he was the prime minister, everybody, and yes, sir, of course, sir, we will do that, sir. Knowing full well that there was no possibility of doing such a thing. And by the time we had our mini Tories in place, and in case you're in any doubt, I hate them. Um, we we had a group of politicians who did who were not interested in digital health in those terms of trying to digitize healthcare pathways for all of the usual reasons of politics. They want to see results in a year, maybe two, but anything that is outside the political cycle is not acceptable because you can't sell it to the electorate. So that's an issue, and I, I bet you it's an issue here. It'll be an issue at a cantonal level and at a federal level. Um, and as I say, it's phenomenally hard to get clinicians to understand all the things they have to do with the digital. It's not how it's taught in medical school. It's not the way older doctors think. It's not the way uh, that the followers of older doctors then are told to do stuff. So all of those tensions mean that that transit that you have, that you are leading is a tough one. Going back to primary care, the answer is that all GPs in England use SNOMED CT. All GPs in Scotland use SNOMED CT and all GPs in Northern Ireland use SNOMED CT. And the reason I emphasize that thing about the countries is it's like your cantons. Scotland is not England. Northern England is not Scotland. They are different countries with different law, with different associations. The medical practice is much the same. And if you have a degree in medicine that you get from a university in England, you can practice in Ireland or you can practice in Scotland without any difficulty. But the laws that make the health service work are different. And um, so that's both an enabler because I would say that one of the reasons in many ways in digital health, Scotland is more advanced than England, is that, the, that first of all, the Scottish have a, a more unified view of what their country is about, and it's, a, and it's small, it has a population of 5 million, so a little bit smaller than Switzerland, but nothing like the population of England, which is something like 65 million now. And making change for 65 million is fantastically hard. Making it for 5 million is a bit easier. So the, the, the vendors in England, basically this was market forces. Uh, so if I go back to 1990 and the transforming events is uh, GPs generally got the picture that running your practice using electronic health records uh, was going to be a, uh, a game changer in terms of being able to make uh, an efficient practice that worked well. And, and again, this you may not be aware, but English GPs are all independent, autonomous business owners of their practice. So they are not part of the NHS. They work within the NHS, but they are individual practitioners running their own business. So they have to make a profit in order to pay themselves. And, and they're paid a per capita amount of money for each patient on their list. So I'm making up the numbers now, but let's say they have 2000 patients on their list and they're paid a hundred pounds uh, each for each patient to provide everything that patient needs. Their income will be 200,000 pounds a year and they have to make a profit from that. Um, and if they don't, they go out of business. And if they do, they get to buy a Maserati. And, you know, uh, so that that's the challenge for them. And the game changer in the 1990s was seeing the business opportunity of making your practice efficient by having 
an electronic register of your patients. So two things happened. One was uh, incentive payments were made by the government that said, if you report the following healthcare things to us, we'll increase that allocation of money by actually not huge amounts, by about 10 to 15 percent. And the things they had to report was a register of patients with hypertension and whether they'd managed to lower the hypertension by X amount. So you had to have a register of all the patients with hypertension and you had to have measurements of their blood pressure. And of course, you can write that down in a bit of paper and then you get a clerk to open the, each record and write it down, put it in a spreadsheet and so on and so forth. But why on earth would you do that if you have a system that can collect that information? And, and so the main things in the quality outcome framework, as it's called, or the QOF, diabetes, hypertension, uh, 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 cholesterol screening, all the things that have potentially public health benefits if you control them well, because the diseases associated with abnormalities are so severe and so serious, and they happen at scale. So that was one. But the real game changer, so I don't know if the person listening is, is uh, gone to sleep because I've talked so long, but the real game changer was prescribing. So if you're prescribing in England, in the past, the patient came to your practice. You said, I've run out of propanolol give me a new prescription. So that meant you had to have a clinic visit, you had to have a conversation, and then you had to write it down, and the patient had to go off and collect the medicines. I'm pretty sure that's what happens to a large extent here, but you may tell me I'm wrong. And it's fundamentally inefficient. And so the big switch was, can I prescribe electronically? And so the patient rings the practice and says, I've run out of propanolol. The practice manager says, Mrs. Smith has run out of propanolol. The GP presses button X on the machine, generates an electronic prescribing sheet, which then the patient picks up and takes to the pharmacy. And the next step in that which was one of the big steps, uh, gains of the National Programme for IT, was connecting the GP practice to a dispensing pharmacy. So that just generated an electronic message of propanolol, please dispense it. And all the patient had to do was nominate a pharmacy that they were going to go to. Originally, there was a kind of token system so the patient got sent an electronic token, and when they went to the pharmacy, they showed their token. They've, we, they, we gave up with that. It's unnecessary. All Mrs. Smith has to do is turn up saying, I'm Mrs. Smith. And, and the pharmacy goes, yep, I've got a prescription. All good. And the patient now, and I'll show you that in some slides later on, can make the request for a new prescription online using the NHS app. The GP presses the button. If they don't want to do it, they can contact the patient and say, I don't think that's the right thing to do for you anymore. So there's a, there are lots of controls in that system. But essentially, it's a contact-free, highly efficient way of prescribing and dispensing medicines. And the GPs, not surprisingly, all said, I've got to have a computer system to do that because it saved them hours of work and made it possible. What's the underlying stuff in the system? Well, it's something called DMD, which is drugs, medicines, and devices. So that's the coding terminology. The drug bit is SNOMED CT. So the drug names are all SNOMED CT. And so, so that's how we deployed in England. I think there are great examples of the use of SNOMED CT in primary care in Denmark, in Sweden, uh, in Norway, um, 
uh, certainly in Holland um, and uh, in Australia as well, actually. And one of the drivers behind the implementations is the bit about beginning to connect up to patients. So once you have some sort of health service application that patients can use, again, to make it reasonably easy to manage and to deliver, you have to have a terminology in it. And I'll stop there. Okay, well, um, Vera tells me I have about uh, 50 minutes or so mm -hmm. um, to talk through these slides. So some of them I will just skip over, I think, because um, I planned a little bit longer. Um, I've introduced myself, Salumitanat, the Snowmed is the title of my talk. Um, I've already told you I'm Charles. Uh, I think it is worth just reminding this group in particular, but maybe people online, that I have a partner in crime called Ian Green, who is a nurse originally, uh, but he is the full time employee for Snowmed International. And if you want to make connections with us, I would suggest that you do it via Ian. Um, I will respond too, but Ian is the great coordinator. And I'm going to start at somewhere a bit unusual uh, because it's sort of meaningful for me, but I think it helps to illustrate the power of Snowman. Um, I work in the hospital where Sir Frederick Treves um, uh, worked. He was a surgeon in about 1880, and he became extremely famous um, in the early 1900s because in theory, he saved the life of the king by doing an appendicectomy. Um, so that's why he got knighted and made sir and all of that stuff. And He's sort of interesting, to, I think, to you as Swiss, in that in the end of his life, he retired to Lausanne and he died in Lausanne. So he has a Swiss connection. And he also retired from clinical practice unusually early, I would say, well, maybe certainly in these days. Uh, he, he retired when he was about 50 and he rode round the, the county of Dorset on a horse and rode a guide uh, called the Highways and Byways in Dorset, where he describes what Dorset was like in those days. But the thing that probably rings your bells is that you will have seen the film or heard of the film called The Elephant Man. So The Elephant Man was a man who now we know had Proteus syndrome, which is an exceptionally rare disease, maybe 50 uh, people in the world have produced disease at any one time. It's genetically a real mystery because the reason it's so, it, the reason it's called proteins is that some of your cells have the genetic mutation that makes things grow and some of you don't, some of them don't. So obviously depending on where that mutation happens, you might like the elephant man have big bumps on your head or big bumps on your shoulder and so on, or you might have almost nothing at all. And it's a precancerous syndrome because the mutations allow cells to grow in an uncontrolled fashion, but not usually in a malignant way, not in a cancerous way. So you get large bumps. So you get a tumour, but not necessarily cancer. And Frederick Treves is famous because he found the elephant man who at the time was used as a circus um, uh, sort of uh, um, a demonstration of how weird humans can be. And he took him out of the circus and housed him in the hospital in which I work. Um, and so he's sort of famous locally for us. Uh, he has that Swiss connection. And we now have a SNOMED term for Proteus syndrome. Um, this is quite a nice tool um, if you get to um, just put that URL in, uh, into the web. And that's what it looks like. And what you can see here is I've put 
the um, uh, Synomic concept ID for Proteus syndrome into that lookup. And I've, uh, there's, these are screenshots. Um, and what that does is open up uh, the full description of 2315001 Proteus syndrome in brackets disorder. So that is the fully specified name for Proteus syndrome. It gives you in the uh, left hand bar looking at the screen the full description of the disorder. And so for those of you who aren't clinicians, this will read like gobbledygook, but basically it means that there's some, there are genetic mutations that uh, change the way that cells behave. And then you can see that there, this particular condition has been described with many different attributes. So it, its occurrence is congenital. It has a finding site, which is anywhere in your bones. It has an associated morphology where the cells look funny when you look at them under a microscope. And the pathological process underlying this is a de developmental uh, process, uh, which is abnormal. And you can see there are lots of other attributes that, that are in the, uh, the dictionary, the Sonoma dictionary. And the reason this is so important is you can use any of those attributes in your search, either within SNOMED or in your assets in the electronic health record to find occurrences, not necessarily of Proteus syndrome, but of something which has a congenital disorder, which is a skeletal system structure. And you can begin to make new findings of things that you weren't expecting. And that's really it with SNOMED CT. It's the ability to use the things in my head which I enter into a record to make new discoveries about humans and human health. And you can see, as I, and I'll describe it a little bit more, the hierarchy goes in the form of parents and children, so you can go further up the hierarchy and use those relationships to find new things, or you can look for uh, the children of the disorder, and we'll look at that in a moment. Here's another one. I just put a number in, and this code is uh, the one about Frederick Treves now and his appendix. So he did one of the first appendicectomies in the UK. Uh, there are lots of different words for appendicectomy. So this is the bit about uh, getting doctors interested in, doesn't matter what word you use, it all means the same thing. So you can call it a excision of appendix, appendicectomy, appendectomy, which is how the Americans might do it, excision of appendix. And we could make that list as long as you want. Um, and I, I don't know which of you are modelers for the for the Swiss edition, but you'll know that uh, there'll be, I don't know, there'll be a favorite German term or French term for appendicectomy, which you can build into this uh, system. And I've highlighted here that you can show this in the SNOMED CT browser. And that's what it looks like in the browser. So here is uh, the term, the excision of appendix. The parents are and it has multiple parents, operation on the appendix, that's important, but it's also an operation on the large intestine. And I can't tell you how long SNOMED modelers have argued about whether the appendix is part of the large, of the large bowel, the colon, or part of the small bowel. The general consensus, because it's, uh, it's right down there, is part of the colon. But obviously this matters if you're searching for stuff. If you, know, you search for something in the colon, you will get appendix. Some people will go, well, that's not right. Or some people will say, yeah, of course it is. Um, anyway, that's the determination. The appendix is a part of the colon, got that? Uh, and you can see that if you go down, you find all the children. And very importantly, you get things like different forms of appendicectomy now using a laparoscope, uh, whether it's in an emergency situation or a planned situation. So if you're trying to get 
a description of how people are using health services, mostly the removal of appendix is done as an emergency purpose, uh, operation, or at least in my lifetime it was. Yeah, because people came in with belly ache, you couldn't image it. There was no, there were no ultrasounds, no CTs, no nothing. So the surgeon, because you can die from appendicitis, they operated on you. Half the appendices, the uh, appendixes were uh, inflamed and needed removing, and the other half, it all was fine. And so you had an unnecessary operation, and we all lived with that. Nowadays, you would probably have a CT scan by before having your surgery. And actually, if that looked normal, they'd probably give you antibiotics, keep you in hospital for a couple of days, and then chuck you out. No operation. That's a different form of care based on data related to imaging. And one of the ways to get to that information is to store it and review it. And that's again where the SNOMED CT comes in, because you've got to have an annotated record where you can pull all of that together and say, what happened to all the 13 year olds, uh, girls who might have had some information in their ovaries or might have had appendicitis? And do we, can we tell the difference by imaging? What do we do about that? How do we make everybody safe and getting the best treatment. So those are the sort of things you can do with SNOMED CT. Here's another way of the way that we show um, uh, the structure of a, of a SNOMED CT. So excision of appendix is a partial ex excision of the last intestine. We just looked at that. It is an operation in the appendix. It has a method. So that's an important part of thinking about SNOMED. And then the method is that we're cutting it out. Yeah. So again, if we're searching through our database, we can look for all procedures that were a kind of excision and we'll find all of the appendectomies. We'll find a million other things as well, but then the guys of you who are good at databases and filtering will know how to filter that. And it has a procedure site, not surprisingly, if you try and take the appendix out from up here, it's not going to work. You have to go down there. So it's the appendix structure that we're interested in. I've shown it to you in a sense in pictures so far, but you can think about it in words. So we're all human beings, and we can get that something in two pipes called excision of appendix in brackets procedure is a procedure on the appendix, and it's cutting it out. The computer doesn't get excision of appendix in brackets procedure, but it does get A0146002 and all of the things associated numerically in RDF format. So now you can start to do significant and serious uh, computation on just using the numbers. And just to extend that, the background bit of work that uh, is done by the modelers is to create axioms using modern uh, descriptive logic techniques. And where, again, I've made it out there in the human readable version, but you can see that you could remove all of the words and just have a series of numbers that defines what an appendix is in numerical terms. That seems very good, but it seems that it's super high resolution. At least I'm not, a, I'm definitely not a clinician, but I think the ability to query and to analyze um, this level of details, of course, requires a very good data quality at input. Yeah. Uh, how does that concretely work in the UK? Are there dedicated clinical nurses to, to enter, to enter data that precision or how does that work? So that's the core question. Can I persuade everybody to do that level of precision to that level of data quality? And I think the simple answer now is even now, the answer is no. It's not zero, but it's not 100%. But actually at scale, it's good enough. 
So, and I'll show you some of that a bit later on in this presentation. But we, as clinical professionals, as health professionals, we could and should do better. I still would argue that this is the route into getting what you've described essentially, which is really deep phenotyping of things, which you can then do queries on. And if we don't do that, we'll end up just being able to say, so how many appendixes did we do last week? Because we can find the words for them. And I think we're beyond that point of science now. It's not that interesting to know how many we did. We want to know how we did. Did we use a laparoscope? Did we have information? What was the pathology like? All of those questions become really important in trying to answer the questions of modern medicine. Yeah. Um, I, 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 this basically is just another way of looking at the computational aspects. For those of you who like this sort of stuff, and it sounds though like you might be, there's some of the syntactical rules around how you write an expression. So that's all in the uh, SNOMED CT uh, assets on Confluence. But here's, some, here's a way for those of you who are neither informaticians or health specialists to think about this. So here's a thing, yeah? It's covered in numbers. It means absolutely nothing to us as humans. I mean, this this is just garbage, isn't it? I have no idea <laughs> what that is. But if I gave you the key to what the numbers are, here, here are the re human readable equivalents of all those numbers. I've given you here that the number is a laparoscopic emergency appendicectomy. And if I now show you the picture decoded for us, you can see that a laparoscopic emergency appendicectomy is an excision, uh, has a direct procedure site, which is the appendix structure. Uh, importantly, for the management and provision of health services, it's an emergency procedure. In other words, a surgeon may do it at three in the morning. That may, may mean nothing to us just sitting comfortably here, but it means a lot to that guy doing it at three o'clock in the morning. Because when he goes back home at four o'clock in the morning, he's want, going to want the day off. He doesn't want to come back and get it. That has profound consequences for the way we actually run hospitals, how, how many doctors, nurses, and so on we need to make things happen. So we're beginning to get information bound uh, the, the precision of healthcare delivery from the terminology that we use. Um, I thought you might enjoy, and I'll just, I don't want to run out of time, um, but I, just to show you how you might yourselves find some SNOMED terms without just using the browser. So I made a, um, uh, a spreadsheet of some things in psychological medicine which are important. Major depressive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, probably all of us in this room have a bit of post-traumatic stress disorder today. I certainly do. Um, and um, I'm going to show you how you can use this tool called STAP to SNOMED. Oh, I've got to shift it. Can we just... Oh, you're going to There is going to be some magic stuff. Right. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So you can just press that and go over it. Let me just um, share again on Microsoft Teams. Here. Here. Yeah, good. Uh, can you minimize this one? Yes. So um, this is a tool, again, available through Confluence. Uh, you have to make an account. I'm going to log in, I hope. 
Um, so I have an account and I ask it to grant me access. And so this is a mapping tool um, where I might want to create a map. So I'm going to create a map. I have to give it a title. And because they're psychology terms, I'm going to call it Psi4. It's uh, version uh, 1.0 of this particular thing. And we'll call it psychology terms. And I've got to import that spreadsheet that I showed you. So I'm going to um, choose a file uh, somewhere hidden away in my documents. I have that file. I'm going to upload it. Source name is required. I'm getting lost. The version is still needed. Seems you need to go up again and then a version. Um, at the top, what's that? At the top, you should. I think you need to give a version. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. What should we have? One point zero. Um, and so I can save all of that uh, somewhere, and I seem to have missed it. I can. Oh yeah. So. So, so far I've created, uh, an, um, so I've created a, a map, um, at least in descriptive terms, I put it in some metadata. I can choose which edition of SNOMED I use. Uh, and I didn't check actually whether there's a Swiss edition that I could have used, but because my German isn't Swiss up me. to it. Um, and I, I could constrain it to just one hierarchy, for example, but I'm going to use any SNOMED code and um, and that's it, basically. Um, so if I save that, uh, you'll see now in the tool, those terms that I had in my spreadsheet are now in this mapping tool. So I've got major depressive disorder. And I want to know, does that have a snow med term that might be suitable for use in an electronic health record or some other way of collecting information? I have to give myself a task uh, to write a map. So I'm going to create a new task, uh, which I need to give it a name. So I'm going to uh, new Psy codes or something like that. Uh, and it's for me. And I want to be the author. But if you were doing this as a as a pair, for example, you could set somebody else who's also got a Confluence account to be a reviewer. And then Pero might uh, decide to map a few codes and ask a clinician friend to say, does that make sense to you? Um, so we won't bother with that right now. Um, why won't it? Uh, oh, yes. And you have to say, how many of these do you want to do? So I've only got 10, I think, or whatever. But obviously, if you had 100 terms or 200 terms, you might want to do it in little blocks. So I'm going to put all and assign. And then uh, I go to uh, my tasks. And I'm going to map that. And you'll see that the screen changes. So I've now got a map called Sci4. I've got something called search target concept, target properties, and an empty field. And I've got uh, my my map at the bottom. I can grab that major depressive order and stick it in this search box. And you'll see that what it's doing is grabbing my the thing I had in my head, which is major depressive disorder, and saying and matching that for terms in uh, the SNOMED dictionary. And it's not 
surprising that it's found a fair number of terms where the words major depressive and disorder are there. So I can go up and down this, finding the code or the, the, co the concept that I think best matches what the person had in their mind. So I would say, OK, well, major depressive order actually has a very specific uh, term or concept, major depressive order. So uh, I, I'm happy with that. I can select it. And actually, it gives me the version that you can see in, um, uh, in a sense, a redistributed version in the SNOMED browser. So this is the middle pane now. You can see major depressive disorder is a kind of depressive disorder. So that's showing you the, the parent term of the, of the child major depressive disorder. And then major depressive disorder has several children. Uh, major depressive, major depression in remission uh, with psychotic features or with sad features, just a single episode. And all of those things may be valuable. You might want to add them to your map. You may want to know more about them. And you can see on the right hand side under target properties, specifically the code, the fully specified name, the preferred term, uh, whether it's active in the database or not at the moment. That's an important concept which we probably can't address today. But SNOMED changes all the time and many codes become inactive. They're still important for uh, uh, for analytics. And so you have to have ways of dealing with that. So um, we're, we're happy with major depressive disorder. And so I'm going to grab that um, that term and put it in here. And it tells me that my term, the thing I had in my mind, has a target code, which is that SNOMED code. The target display, the human readable version, is major depressive disorder. Its uh, default relationship is inexact, but we think that's an exact match. So I'm going to say it's equivalent. It's no longer draft, and I'm going to say mapped, and I've done my job. I'm now going to send it to the reviewer and say, do you agree? And they can say, no, I don't. I think that's rubbish. Or, yeah, I do. And they can put notes and comments and so on. And so together, you and a clinician or a clinician and somebody else can develop a map of snow midterms, which they can use maybe initially in a paper record and find those or in a spreadsheet or preferably in a fully specified EHR with SNOMED implemented for a GP, for example, because a GP will spend at least half of their working lives seeing patients with a depressive disorder. You can be sure of that. Yeah, the number of patients they'll see with appendicitis, one a year. Number of patients with cancer, one a year. Number of patients with a psychological unhappiness, 50% of the practice. And so they'll be really interested in this aspect of using SNOMED. I'm just going to show you one last thing on this, which is, so I've done it manually by choosing one and finding it, but I can go. <clears throat> is it important in the mapping task Who's the most precise well, approach, or just one level up? Because you say it's important to know it's just psychological disorder, um, depression. So, so that's a great question. And of course, that this really depends on what you're trying to do. So if you want, if you're trying to implement SNOMED in a solution and you want to give the clinicians access to particular codes and you want to constrain it, then you might want to go up. You might want to go down. You might want to give them all of the codes. Those are kind of implementation questions about what 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 do people want to see, how do they want to use it, and all of those kind of questions. But part of this, I think, is be, is beginning to show you that you can go up, you can go down, and you you might, for analytical purposes, obviously want the whole of SNOMED CT, but at the at the point of care, you might want actually to use a very granular term 
Um, and then for the analytics, go up a rung or two rungs uh, and so on. So I, I hope that sort of gives you an idea of what you could do. But I think the, the answer to your question is what do you want to do with it? What, what is it? What is, what's the thing you're trying to build for somebody? Um, so I also have a second question in the chat. Um, as I understand it, all coding is only referencing something um, at one particular point in time. Are you aware of any formal language or any uh, or another layer of terminology to put these into a timely relation? Like, IG, an inflammation caused by an appendix excision three days ago. Yeah. So again, a great question and one that everybody wrestles with. And how shall we do that? So SNOMED itself doesn't model time. It would make it impossible to use. And you have to, I think, in the end, use the electronic health record to model time. So you, so uh, most electronic health records are based on the concept of an encounter, an event in time. So, so you have some fields which have a date and time. The, you, the time you enter that is dated and timed. And so if you've got an admission to hospital to Ward X, um, uh, which is a surgical ward, and the code entered is appendicitis, and the procedure code entered the next day is appendicectomy, you begin to get an answer to that vital question, which is what's happening to the patient over time. But this is, I, I mean, I think it's one of the core questions of medicine. How do you do this well? Uh, and I think that's at least one answer. There would be other ways of adding metadata to uh, the forms that you're completing. But uh, the one thing I would say is my experience of this in real practice is every time you put another data item in that a doctor or nurse has to fill, increasingly you get your problem, which is the data quality gets worse. Because people say, 10 things, 20 things, 50 things, I'm just not doing that. And so you have to make it part of what they're doing normally to make it work. The data may be not perfect, but as I said, it's usually good enough and it's you. It may be good enough to answer those kind of questions. Um, There's just a remark by the same person who asked a question, enjoying your talk and humor so much. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so all I was going to show you is, is an auto map facility. So if I press auto map. You'll see that uh, a window says I've automated 13 of the 14 concepts you've got. So I go OK. If I go down to that window, you'll see that the machine has now mapped all of my terms with and and it, it's the default is inexact and draft. I would then go through these saying is prominent post traumatic stress disorder a post traumatic stress disorder in SNOMED? I think so. I'd say that was an equivalent uh, and it's uh, it's now mapped. And you'll see that one term is not mapped. And this is both one of the riches and one of the challenges, which I don't think we'll have time to talk about, about SNOMED. SNOMED does not allow you to create ambiguous terms. So problems in engaging with clinic and or treatment recommendations is completely ambiguous. Well, no, if you use that as a term, no one would know what you were trying to express. So it's not in SNOMED. So not surprisingly, you can't find the term. Um, however, us humans totally understand what that says. You know, here's a patient who's really struggling with the things that are happening to them. And I just want a general concept to describe that because I can read that. And when I next see the patient, I say, oh, yeah, I remember you can't follow any of the instructions for taking your pills. What's how, how is it going today? So that's part of the discourse of a nurse or doctor with the patient, but it's no good for computational analytics. What you could do 
is to write what's called a post-coordinated expression, where those two ideas about difficulty of coming to the clinic and difficulty of taking real medicine were put together as a single expression with the uh, syntactical uh, comments in, in the line, and you could use that. All I would say is, first of all, I don't know how to do it. Most informaticians are struggling with how to do it so that it is safe and so that the semantic content of the, of the expressions that you write is maintained and is computable. But if any of you want to get rich and famous, then learn to do post-coordinated expression. Do it in a health record which clinicians could use and then you're beginning to write computationally active human thinking in a record which is human readable and computable. But it's still a work in progress, I would say. Can you do it, Perry? <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> right. Uh, so I'm going to drop out of this and. Sorry, I just have a question about this tool. Yeah. Uh, the, auto, the automatic future a function. Is there an NLP pipeline behind them for doing this mapping? Uh, or is this like a string? It's, it's, it's string matching. OK. Um, but there are commercial tools to do what you've said. Um, so they're quite widely available. And there are also quite a lot of open sourced tools to map uh, words into Snowman. Um, so there's, there's stuff on GitHub. There's a uh, there's a quite a big group based at King's College Hospital in London where they use a tool called Cogstack. They have all of their code on GitHub and so on, and it's basically available. So um, the, 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 the things you're looking for are out there. Related to that, so does it allow for inaccuracies and typos, or is it quite restricted in what it accepts as an input to map? Um, good question. So the commercial tool we use in my hospital, we, my, the, the, the group of data scientists spend a lot of time uh, dealing with what you've just described. So the, machi the, the machine has to be taught. Uh, some of it's really quite manual. Dealing with negation is as you know, a very hard computation problem. So that's the question of not something. This patient does not have diabetes. Doing that reliably so that they really don't have diabetes, uh, because all through uh, such a record, you'll find things like his mother has diabetes, but he does not. And obviously, NLP tools may well end up saying, so this patient has diabetes. And, and in the end, you have to you have to train the machines on individual sentences. Um, they're getting better at it all the time. And you can we you know you can get to consistency on this, but it's hard work, I would say. So, um, so another question online. Um, you mentioned NLP for extracting SNOMED codes from clinical reports and notes. How accurate would you would that be with existing documents? So I would say at the moment it's a research tool only. Um, so you can you can definitely get tons of useful computable information. And because it's at scale, you've got big data. Frankly, if there are a few errors, it's not going to matter. You're not going to kill anybody. If you were going to use the extract for clinical care in a record, you'd have to have a human interface that says, OK, you put that text in. I think I've got these 10 SNOMED codes that you might want to add to the record. Is that right? And you'd go tick, 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 cross, tick, 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 and so on. Um, and that's, at the moment, the only tools that do that kind of thing have, have that approach, some sort of human review process. Be because of the problem of, of negation and all of those, the misspells and the typos and so on, you can't be certain that what the machine extracts yet is good enough for clinical care. Because if you were going to make, uh, I don't know, a decision support bit on this, so penicillin sensitive, in brackets, not, 
Yeah, it really matters on whether you, when you're going to prescribe penicillin. If they're sensitive, you really don't want to give them penicillin. But if they're not, you really do, because it might be life saving. So those questions are still to wrestle with, I'd say. We need to go back to, oh, what am I going to do? Just close it? Yep. This is the presentation, right? Presentation, right? Yeah, that's it. And I increase Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. So, which one of those you just to change that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to skip a few slides now because we're very close uh, to the end. Um, I was going to show you some of the structure of the so-called machine readable concept model. So those again, those of you who are a bit more computation might like to log on to the machine readable concept model demonstration. But basically this sets out the rules for creating an axiom. So it says if something's a clinical finding and it has a proceed, uh, it has a finding side, then you can use this bits of SNOMED to create a term. Uh, and so it's a way of both um, creating the axiom and constraining and making sure you're not making wrong use of the descriptive logic. Um, but I won't uh, actually give you a demo. I was going to give you all an opportunity to have another bio break uh, and use a little bit of marmot paste on, on your skin and muscles to get you fit and vigorous. But I think we've run out of time there. We have for half an hour. Have you still got half an hour? Yeah, yeah we're still. OK, on. but I think I'll press on, shall I? And we'll have a break in half an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm now going to go a bit more clinical on you and begin to give you examples of what I call real world data questions. So you're, you've got data in your systems. You'll have lab data, you'll have imaging data. Some of it will be annotated, some of it won't be. And let me t show you sort of kind of questions that I think, well, anybody might want the answer to, but these will probably be more meaningful at the moment for people with a science background an informatics background, a clinical background, I think the ordinary citizen, you'd have to explain this question a bit. But here is a key cancer question, which is show me all the genes uh, that have mutations in them from a biobank where somebody has annotated those samples with a diagnosis of something. And I give you as an example, uh, the clinical term for lung cancer. So we're going to find all of those genes from all the patients with lung cancer. And then we know that Mr. Big Pharma somewhere, and you guys in Switzerland are particularly good at Big Pharma. So they have even bigger databases than they have Big Pharma, where they have 50 years of databases with compounds that they have made, which may or may not have an effect on human beings. And their interest is twofold. One is to make sell those drugs to make humans better. And secondly, to make sure that all your pension funds are happy and that you're getting your pensions OK because it makes them tons of money if they get an active drug. And so they want to test the knowledge of what the... So now you can say, we know that that mutation changes this particular enzyme and, does, and turns on this growth factor. And we know we have some compounds that target that growth factor receptor. And we want to match those data. So that's a core precision medicine question done every day now in every cancer hospital. Give me the drugs that make this work for this patient. And us little doctor brains can't remember all of that. We can't select the right drug for the right mutation consistently. We have to look it up. We either have to go into a book 
and look it up and say, oh, yeah, OK. Or we have to have a pharmacist who says, hey, doc, this one won't work. Or you need a machine that says, hey, I know this patient has lung cancer. Hey, I know they have this uh, genetic mutation. And hey, you can't use this drug that you're trying to prescribe. So it's like the uh, penicillin sensitive, but much, much harder to do. Uh, but it's a core question. And the kind of setup, for example, we have uh, at Bart's Health now for doing some of these things is that we have a data warehouse with free text and we are doing some natural language processing there and creating out an output which we put into a structured data table. This is in the research zone. This is not immediate bedside clinical care. And then we're writing queries on SNOMED to say, find me the value codes that might be relevant to this set of data, put it together into a research ready structured uh, data set and let the clinicians go crazy. And they do. And uh, we'll, I'll give you the, an example of the sort of thing that they're doing, perhaps in cancer. So here's an equivalent but more precise um, uh, data set that we're using for pancreatic cancer and breast cancer. So we've got a clinical data uh, biobank, uh, which is all SNOMED encoded, because we've had people, going back to your question, actually, which was, who does this? So I'm going to talk about perfection. I am a complete non-supporter of the idea that a doctor should have a scribe who enters information from it. I think that's a shocking um, derogation of the responsibility of being a clinician. You have to add your concepts into the record, and you can't have a nurse or another person writing it for you. But they all squeak and they all say, oh, I can't do it, it's too hard, and all of that. But they have to get into this kind of thinking, I would say. And they have to be annotating the record. There, there's the good reason is that you get better precision, better data quality in some because they understand what they want to put in. And there is a legal reason, which if somebody takes them to court, they can't, I think, reasonably say to the judge, oh, it wasn't me, it was that nurse. And so there are some legal arguments why doctors need to record structured data, I think. Um, but that's a hard argument to have with people because they get all defensive about it. Um, back to my slide, we then got uh, clinical data from primary care. So for the person who was asking about primary quest data, we get a flow of data from our primary care colleagues, which is about the symptoms that the patient presented before they came to hospital with a diagnosis of breast cancer or pancreatic cancer. And we can begin to answer that question about time. When was the earliest we could have made a guess that this patient had pancreatic cancer? As you know, well, probably maybe you don't, but pancreatic cancer at the moment is kind of universally fatal. You have the diagnosis made, in a year to two years, you will be dead. About 5% long-term survival. So it's really, really bad. And it's your survival is much better if you if you present early and have uh, a pancreatic excision done at that time. Um, it's finding those patients who have incredibly unclear symptoms to start with that just don't feel very well. Oh, I've got a little bit of tummy ache. Oh, I feel sick in the mornings. Those kind of things. And everybody feels sick and tummy ache in the morning, particularly if you had too much whiskey the night before. <laughs> so finding those people and find, using the descriptive terms to do predictive analytics and find those patients early so they can be treated early is the challenge of cancer therapy. Um, and then in the top box, we have the genomic data. And we put it into a clinical decision support system of which the output looks roughly like this. So here's a woman with breast cancer who's been heavily pretreated, and 
what the machine is saying, with that combination of mutations that we've discovered in the tissue, and this set of uh, drugs, which are on that side, we can tell you, we can be certain about you know, nearly 100% that the ones marked in red, if you use those, the patient will not respond because by definition, they have become resistant to the treatment. And so use one of the blue ones. And then there are probably some clinical decisions to make about which blue one you make, which will be based on how toxic the drug is, how old the patient is, could they survive such a treatment and so on. Those are the clinical decision making. So this does not impoverish the, the, the clinical thinking a doctor has to make. In fact, it enriches it because it says those ones you don't have to worry about because they won't work, but you still got these ones to think about. Uh, and that seems to me where we're all going with uh, particular treatments. Um, so I'm going to skip very quickly through these slides. All I would say to you, if you're thinking about implementations and the things that could add really serious and significant value to an electronic health record is get in there with some pathologists and say, guys, stop writing essays about your pathology. I took this section of tissue and I cut it in a slice and then I looked at it in a microscope and I said this and that and the other about it. All human text. They love writing it. I bet you in German, they like it even more using words about five feet long. And <laughs> it's useless. And there are ways of encoding that at the point at which they're in the microscope or on the, your digital pathology slides and annotating the picture actually with SNOMED. At that point, you have some amazing stuff because you've got the stuff for the analytics, which you can then use in the thing I've just shown you. And the next time you get a breast cancer tissue, the machine can start to report saying, you know that thing you annotated last time? I found a version of it in this slide. Do you want to add it to the slide? Yes or no? Pathologist has a look, says, yeah, that's the same thing. Well done, machine. And obviously in 10 years time, the, the pathologist is going to be doing something different. I don't know what exactly, but the, that pre-screening of the pathology specimen will be done automatically using machine learning and artificial intelligence. I think that's for certain. That's happening in radiology. Same challenge to you. Get a radiologist to do a synoptic report of their radiology image. That is hard work. They can do it. Some are really interested, but the majority, and they all blather on about artificial intelligence and how great it is, but actually getting them to add the substrate that makes AI and machine learning really work well is hard work. So either you do NLP, and they're spending all their time looking at NLP output saying, is that what you really meant? Or they just start with the terms themselves. And I think it's a, it's not a hard choice, frankly, but it, it does seem harder than you'd expect. Um, uh, so I, I think, this section, again, is just a, an example of um, using SNOMED in a slightly different way. So here's the, the question, clinical question. Show me all the procedures performed on the gastrointestinal tract. So anywhere from up here to down there, where the apparent surgical problem was a perforation in that tube. So as you know, perforations happen because you get an absent, abscess in a bit of bowel and it bursts. Somebody gives you a bit of brufen and it bursts your stomach. Or you get a blockage in your artery and the piece of tissue below the artery dies and you have a bit of gangrene in your bowel and that explodes. Deadly for the human it happens to. Hard to diagnose, 
because you can't see the perforation from the outside. You probably can't see it on an X-ray. You might see it on a scan because you might see some air somewhere in the bowel, those sort of things. But the question here is, find me the procedures on the gastrointestinal joint where there's perforation and where somebody has previously given you an anti-inflammatory agent, either steroids or um, an anti-inflammatory like uh, ibuprofen, all of which are known to cause this problem. A great cause of human suffering, uh, bad outcomes usually. And so the question is an important one. And what I was going to do was show you a little bit how to write an expression constraint language uh, query to do that. Um, but I'm slightly nervous that I'm going to uh, run out of time. So what shall we do? You have 22 minutes left. So. OK, well, I'll try. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. Because what I wanted to show you is how you can use SNOMED to get you a list of procedure codes that answer that question. So I'm going to go uh, now to the browser. And I'm going to need a bit of your magic. But just, um, oh yeah, okay. Don't get too sure. I'm going to take that home with me. <laughs> Good. Stop. Maybe to start with, and then start off the screen. Yeah. Screen. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, it's gone. There it is. Um, so I haven't, I think, shown you the browser yet, except to show you that that's where the machine readable concept model is. So I think you may be interested in, in that. And this is just. Yeah, online on the um, SNOMED International Browser site. Um, here's uh, all of different versions. Um, so the UK and Spain have their own uh, uh, editions and extensions. Um, there is a little Swiss flag there. So hey, look, it's go right. browsing Swiss edition. It's there. Yeah. So I, I don't know what language it's in. You must do. Italian, French, and German. It is. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's outstanding. But I'm going to go to the international edition. And um, very briefly, here you can um, do things with just seeing what the taxonomy looks like. So if, you're, uh, if you've got obsessive compulsive disorder, you could get to the term and concepts you're interested in, not by using SNOMED, uh, Snap to SNOMED, not by browsing on search, but working your way through the hierarchy until you find something. I'd have to say, I think you'd be mad to try, but it is one way of doing it. Um, alternatively, you can search on something, and this the search tools are pretty cool. And uh, they will find things with just a few letters. So you put PNE in, you get pneumonia, pneumocytes, and so on. If I choose, if I choose pneumonia, you'll see that pneumonia is a lung consolidation and is also a form of pneumonitis, uh, inflammation of the lung. It has a finding site, not surprise, surprisingly, of lung structure. So if you've got pneumonia and something that isn't a lung, you've got it wrong. Uh, and it has morphology, which is information and consolidation. That starts again to answer the question about timing. Because you're beginning to get uh, concepts put in the record with a time date stamp, because that's how all computer systems work. Let's say at that point, I thought, this patient had inflammation consolidation because I thought they had pneumonia. It's not quite the answer to the question, but it's getting there. Um, and then I want to show you how you might make um, a, a query by trying to limit SNOMED, which is vast, way beyond human understanding. You know, 
500,000 concepts, uh, millions of possible combinations with uh, preferred terms and all of that. So you, you, you've got to find ways of restricting what you want to look for, either in SNOMED or matching it to your data warehouse of terms. Um, so if I press the ECL button and say, I want to find um, Let's see if it'll get there. This is sometimes a bit annoyingly slow. So, if I, okay, so um, I'm going to put procedure by site and add a refinement, which is all descendants of um, body structure. Hopefully it finds me something. Maybe I just try structure. It's not being nice to me. Well, let me, I'll, I'll just do one thing. Uh, so I've got now a expression constraint query which says, show me all of the things in SNOMED which are a procedure by site, yeah? And I can execute that <laughs> and it tells me I've got, oh, I see. Um, and if I go OK on that and execute that query, it goes grinding along, looking through SNOMED for all of the procedures by site. And obviously there are thousands, so it's taking a bit of time. And I think if I get nowhere with this. Oh, yeah, there. OK. So procedure by site has. 36,470 concepts, yeah. And if I went back into the expression constraint builder and um, uh, we might just try this. Um, I'll go back into the builder and make a refinement. And I say direct morphology, and I search for perforation. So there's a, 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 a morphology term of perforation, and I go, OK, so now I've got a query, which is procedure side with direct morphology of perforation. And I go OK and then execute that. And it goes grinding along. And it finds 21 concepts. OK, so I've essentially what I've done is use the attributes in SNOMED to filter an idea that I have, which is there are some procedures in that I that surgeons do. And I'm interested in the ones that are about a perforation in a human organ. And so I've gone from 37,000, which are just all the procedures, and where I've filtered by um, um, morphology. And now I can say, well, there are 21 concepts. Perhaps not surprisingly, 
They're mostly gastroenterology ones. So you can see there's patch repair of a duodenal ulcer, uh, something that happened to your stomach, uh, something of the colon, a mental patch. But because I didn't constrain it to gastrointestinal only, there are some other things that happen. So somebody's um, created a urinary reservoir. That might be a thing you put into the body. It might be a way of describing the bladder, but there's a hole in it. That's obviously not great for the human being. There's almost certainly, again, a, um, a um, iatrogenic problem with a uterine perforation. The uterus doesn't usually explode. So somebody in doing something surgical to the uterus, either in the delivery of a baby or uh, care of a miscarriage or um, a medical termination and so on, has perforated that uterus. So I found them all using this way of filtering. As I say, if I was only interested in the gastrointestinal one, I would add another filter or, or constraint to the query saying, just show me the gastrointestinal one. So I'd find a body structure, which is just got the gastrointestinal tract. That's the way you can get to a manageable list of codes for doing the kind of complex analytics that I think many of your guys will want to do. Um, oh, look, and you can perforate the gallbladder as well. Um, so that's, uh, uh, again, bad for the human, uh, good for the surgeon. Um, right, I'm going to come out of this. And, uh, am I closing now? Oh, no, just... I saw it. I, haven't, I still haven't got it. <laughs> <laughs> Just switch. You'll be all relieved to hear there are no more demos. Okay, so uh, this is the last clinical question, and this is so. This is uh, work that actually we did practically in East London, and. Um, was really important at the time and where we developed a tool that we made run live in our system. But you're probably aware um, that each country had slightly different approach to vaccination. I think in Switzerland you only used mRNA vaccines, I can't quite remember, but uh, we did use adenovirus uh, 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 um, uh, vaccines in England and um, they were they were uh, highly effective in preventing or at least reducing um, infection and uh, death from um, COVID. But um, it became clear after a few months that a very small number of patients, something like one in a hundred thousand, maybe one to two hundred thousand, presented as an emergency, about five to 30 days after the vaccination with really unusual forms of thrombosis. They had thrombosis of the veins of the brain. They had internal jugular venous thrombosis, thrombosis of the splanchnic veins, the, the vein of the liver, and also more conventional thrombosis in the legs and so on. And at least initially, it was thought that that, thrombose, that complication of vaccination had a really high mortality rate, sort of 30, 40 percent. As time passed, it did look as though it wasn't as dangerous as that, but it was definitely bad for you. And the reason it probably became less disastrous for the humans getting the complication is that hematologists got better at treat one, recognizing the condition, and two, treating it. Because it was pretty clear that this wasn't simply a coagulation event. It had an autoimmune uh, bit. So people were developing antibodies 
to a component of platelets that activated the platelets that made the clot happen. And you needed to treat both aspects. So it wasn't simply a question of thinning the blood with anticoagulants. And so here's the question that we uh, articulated from our, for our database, which was show me all of the patients who'd had COVID vaccination five to 30 days after they'd been vaccinated and who then presented to the hospital with any kind of thrombosis. So remember I said brain, neck, uh, lungs, splanchnic veins, legs and so on. So that's where ICD-10 is hopeless because ICD-10 you'd have to find all the codes for everything. Here you could write an expression constraint query that simply says, show me all the kinds of thrombosis that you can find where the mor morphology is thrombosis and the, and the structure is a vein structure. And you get every kind of code you can think of. Um, and so we, and we've decided probably correctly that anybody getting serious effects for, uh, side effects from COVID vaccination of the kind I've described would present to an emergency problem. They wouldn't go to their GP and say, hey, I've got a thrombosis in my brain. They would say, hey, I'm going to hospital. So uh, we thought we were pretty safe by saying, can we find those patients with any kind of thrombosis and where some of the lab features that people by then had decided were important was, had the platelet count gone down? Was there evidence of activation of the coagulation system? And could we find that antibody thing, the immunological reaction, which was antibodies to platelet effect four? And so what we said, can we answer that question from the data in our data warehouse in East London? So one thing you've already spotted, I'm sure, is that the hospitals did not do the vaccination. GPs did the vaccination. So we had to get data from primary care. They hold the vaccination data. And I would guess that something similar goes on in Switzerland. I don't know where you get your vaccinations, but you don't go to hospital to be vaccinated. Another um, question in the chat. Um, yeah. Very interesting. You mentioned that you developed the tool running continuously. Was this developed by Cicero or was it sort of an in-house development? So I'll answer that as I go through what, what we did. Okay. Um, um, so East London is a big part of London. And there are about 2.2 million people who live there. We knew that in the period between the 1st of December 2020 and July 2021, 128,000 people had come to our emergency department. We run three emergency. So we knew that we had 128,000 people who came. And then we asked the question, how many of those Uh, were registered with general practitioners in East London. Because we're big central hospitals, people come from anywhere. So we, we knew we only had data around vaccination for people who had, be, had a GP in East London. So we uh, knew from that 104,000 who had a registered GP in East London, 72,000 of them had a vaccination in the time period that we were interested in. So we had basically 72,000 patients and we could then start to answer, ask the question, how many of those presented with thrombosis and had those uh, lab tests that I mentioned? So uh, these are the, the data items we chose. Um, so we chose patients um, actually with a slightly wider scope than just the thrombosis question. Because if you cast your minds back, you'll probably remember 
that people getting COVID vaccination also presented with myocarditis, with something called Bell's palsy, which is partial paralysis of the face, and a rare neurological condition called Guillain-Barré syndrome. They're all probably autoimmune conditions. And so we thought, well, while we're asking the question, that's extended a bit further than thrombosis. Uh, but obviously our main uh, uh, mission here was to find the thrombosis patients. Going back to, again, the person who was interested in dates and time sequence, we had an attendance date and we had a date for a thrombosis diagnosis, an admission date if they got admitted to hospital, the day somebody put a diagnosis of thrombosis into a problem list. And obviously we had date stamps for every lab test done. We were only interested in the plate account, the thing called D-dimer, which is the measurement of the uh, uh, coagulation uh, um, uh, activation, and this platelet factor antibody. Um, so we had those data. Um, uh, we limited it a bit. So, uh, so we had, we had, they had to attend the emergency department. We decided we wouldn't look at children partly because there was no evidence that children were affected by these things, and partly because we thought the information governance rules around doing this without anybody's permission, so we didn't ask individuals, can we do this study on you? We did do it, um, uh, the data sources were de-identified, but then relinked using the NHS number, um, uh, which is part of the genius of the NHS, is that we have every patient or every human on Earth has a number. So you can sort of, you can mostly de-identify it, but link data. So that's uh, a nice bit of our system. So and the problem, we only have a couple of minutes because the room is booked for an okay. meeting. So I better get going. So uh, electronic health records, that's what we use. We match those codes. Uh, and so there, if for those of you who get the, this slide set, those are the expression constraint queries that produce all of the thrombosis types that we're interested in without having to crawl through ICD-10 and find every thrombosis type that you can think of. And remember, some of these won't have existed because ICD-10 was written, what, 20 years ago, long before any of this was invented. And could we find them? Well, the answer is yes. So my hospital is one called Bart's. We found most of them, but not all of them. And you might say, well, that's terrible. What's the point of view at all? And the reason we didn't find all of them is that three patients came from unregistered in northeast London. So they were they were registered, but not in our area. So that's a challenge for you in Switzerland, for sure. You've got 22 health authorities all doing your own thing. I don't know if you have uh, registration numbers that cross and so on. But your patients with thrombosis will not be going to a GP or you know, little cantonal hospitals. They'll be going to the major ones. And so these studies are hard. Um, but we then did make that algorithm run every day, looking for patients with any kind of thrombosis who'd had a vaccine and who um, uh, had those abnormalities in their plate account and so on. And you won't be surprised to hear because of then, because practice had changed in relation to vaccination, that we found only one possible case, which the hematologist reviewed and said, well, we didn't spot that patient. On review, we don't think that they had COVID, vac COVID vaccine related thrombosis, but we don't know what they did have and they needed anticoagulation. So thanks very much for finding. Um, I think what we would say now is if something like this happened again, we could set up the search engine. This took months, you won't be surprised to hear, partly to work through the information governance permissions and all of that, and partly because we didn't know what to do. And um, now we do, we could set this up in a week or two, and we would be finding patients yes. rare, but important complications of anything. We, this is replicable right across the health system. So we think this is really cool. And uh, can, and we've, we've got other participants uh, in, at Imperial College, 
in Birmingham and in Scotland to do similar things. So we, it wasn't just us. We found actually other partners in crime who would who could set up their data systems to make similar kind of searches. We were the only one who made serious use of Snowden. So here am I saying England's great, everybody's got Snowman, but that's not the case. Yeah. So that's a challenge. But I think it's until you do this kind of stuff and you show its potential or real value that you begin to make the change. So I know that Perro is getting very, very nervous. So I'm just going to say one last thing. If you want to make SNOMED work in your health systems, you as a group have to learn about SNOMED. You have to be able to talk about it with passion and, and sense. And you have to persuade people who go, why would I do that? I'm never going to do that. It's too hard and so on. So it is possible to overcome those barriers. You have to have EHR systems that record SNOMED. If you don't, I don't think you'll make progress. I think you become hugely persuasive when you have a SNOMED CT based pipeline for analytics. So something like our VIT studies, everybody begins to go, whoa, how did you do that? So they really begin to buy into the idea. You have to find ways of tooling up each of your systems to use SNOMED CT. And I think I hope I was persuasive that articulating the questions in the way that I did helps people to understand what it is you're after and why actually entering some data can make a huge difference. So saying, show me the patients with X and Y and this treatment and this effect, every doctor gets that question. I think every human being gets that question because they can imagine what it's like to be the person taking the tablet or taking the vaccination. So being able to answer that question, Doc, are you going to kill me with this vaccine? I mean, we've managed to persuade half the globe that it's really, really, really dangerous to have a vaccine. It is bonkers. You know, this is madness, isn't it? To have suddenly created a system where vaccines are, that have been so life-saving in, what, in 200 years? since the first vaccines were done for smallpox, to then have populations saying, oh, I'm not doing that, it's too dangerous. I, 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 it's sort of beyond belief, I think, but I think the data begins to answer this. You can begin to say, it won't be for you, it'll be fine, because we know this about you. And that's the key question for patients. I know this about you, and I can do things safely. And I'll stop there. <laughs>